السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد What I wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you about I know الحمد لله throughout the convention we've heard some incredibly inspirational talks and we have had uh, hopefully a t a, you know, opportunities to reflect and inshallah to improve ourselves and our families and our communities as Muslims to really seriously rethink what we're living our lives for. In this last session that I have with you, what I want to talk to you about is something in light of Surah Al-Ankabut, as it was said, a reality check in light of Surah Al-Ankabut. And this is really from the beginning of Surah Al-Ankabut, the 29th Surah of the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Alif Lam Mim, Ahasib al Nas, and Yutraku, and Yakulu Amanna, Wahum La Yuftanun. Now listen carefully, please. Alif Lam Mim, have people assumed, Ahasib al Nas, and Yutraku, have people assumed that they are going to be left alone, that they are going to be left abandoned, left to their own devices, and Yakulu Amanna, that they get to say that we have believed. وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ And they are not going to be put through severe tests. Allah asks the question, did people really think that people are going to just be able to say that they believe and then they are not going to go through some very difficult tests? وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ We have certainly tested those who came before them. Now these ayat, the term in Arabic used is fitna. Fitna. And so I'll talk a little bit about the word fitna first. You know, nowadays we use it only in a negative sense, right? So we use the word fitna like you see someone walking into the masjid, man, that guy is a fitna, right? Or there's a lot of fitna in the bazaar, right? Or whatever. Don't go to Aruba, there's too much fitna, etc., etc. So we use fitna in a negative sense. But actually, in the original Arabic sense, the word fitna refers to a difficult test. It refers to a difficult test. And the other interesting meaning of fitna in Arabic is to, to be attacked or to attack. So, you know, if a group attacked another group. In other words, if the attack was very strong and the, the other group almost died, they almost were not able to withstand the brunt of the attack, that kind of an attack would be called a fitna. Interestingly enough also, fitna is used in Arabic, fattana is used in Arabic, when you uh, purify gold. When you purify gold. Now the process of purifying gold, if you're not familiar, you have to melt gold at extremely high temperatures. And when you melt that gold, the impurities melt away and froth and they rise to the top and they disappear. And this is an extremely difficult process and only through that process you can tell the purity or the level of purity of that gold. So the amount of carrots it's going to be depends on how pure that gold is, which means how much fitna has it gone through. Actually, that is the original meaning of the word fitna. It is actually a way of testing the purity of gold. A way of testing the purity of gold. So now, having that meaning in our background, when Allah says, do people, have people assumed that, we're, that they're going to be left alone after saying that they've believed and they are not going to be put through the test like gold is put through the test when it's melted. That's the illusion made in the ayah. It's, it's alluding to this concept of gold being purified. Now, as opposed to purifying, you know, you know there's in a, in, a, in a farm somewhere, in a village somewhere, there's a woman sitting there, she's got a, you know, a, like a big tray of rice and she's picking out the impurities from the rice. That's a kind of purification too. That's a cleansing too, but it's, re it's relatively easy. When people are washing their clothes, they're also purifying, that's still relatively easy. But purifying gold, you can't just sit on a corner and go with a sponge and clean gold. You can't do that because the impurities are where? Where are the impurities? 
They're not on the surface, they're deep inside. And you cannot access the inside until you melt it under extreme temperatures. Now interestingly enough, in this ayah, Allah talked about Iman. Where is Iman? Is that on the surface or on the inside? It's on the inside, which means the impurities that can attack this Iman are also resting deep inside. Which means, if you want to purify something deep inside, you have to raise the temperature and you have to, put, you have to be put through some extreme test so that those impurities can be removed. You follow what I'm saying so far? Right, this is the concept of fitna when it comes to our Iman. Our Iman is being put to the test by difficulty and Allah is saying, how could you have assumed that you will be given this incredible treasure of Iman and not be put to difficult tests? Now these ayat came in the later period of the Meccan struggle of the Prophet This is around the time where Muslims were starting to get tortured. Khabab bin Arat was actually forced to lie down on burning coal and then they stood on top of his chest until his entire back peeled off, it melted off. He was horribly bruised, horribly burned. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ and says, how can, this be, how can this happen to us and we are the people of truth? What did we do to deserve this? Why would Allah let this happen to us? And the Prophet ﷺ said, you're rushing too much, you're getting too impatient. And then these ayat came down. Did people really think they're not going to be tested? Subhanallah. Like he was literally melted like gold is melted. And Allah says, did you think you're not going to be tested? Now the reason I want to start with this ayah, and my, probably my entire talk will revolve around this ayah, is that fitna changes. The fitna that the Sahaba faced was different. The fitna that you and I face is different. The tests and the trials of our faith, and by the way, they're not even the same all over the world. The fitna that the people in Palestine are facing is different. The, the, the fitna that people are facing in Iraq is different, in Pakistan is different, in Bangladesh is different, in Trinidad is different, in Tobago is different. Even though Sheikh Abdul Nasser says Tobago. Okay, it's different. The fitna I face in Texas, and my family faces in Texas is different, than the fitna some family faces in California is something else. It's different. Based on our lives, based on the challenges you know, that we live in our lives, all of us have a different set of fitnas. But there is one common fitna that I want to talk to you about today. One common difficult test that almost the entire ummah is going through in light of this ayah that I want to talk to you about. And this is not based on some academic research. This, is, this talk is actually inspired by countless emails over the last 10 years on exactly the same subject by thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So I want to summarize these emails for you first. Here's how it sounds. Brother Numana, I have a question. If Quran is really for all human beings, why is it in Arabic? It's not my fault that I'm not an Arab and that I don't have the opportunity to learn the Arabic language or that I'm not a scholar. So if I can't understand it, if it was really meant for all human beings, it should have been in every language so that it could be perfect for each of us. We could directly relate to it in our own languages. Another question along with that, this, you know, how, how in the, what's the point of praying if I don't even understand what I'm reciting in Salah? At least the Sahaba, at least the Sahaba, when they heard the Quran being recited in prayer, they used to cry. But why did they used to cry? Because they understood what's being recited and they were moved by that. But the vast majority of us Muslims today, whether we're living in Malaysia or India or Africa or Trinidad, the vast majority of us, when Salat is being made and the Quran is being recited, even in, especially in Taraweeh prayer for example, do we get most of what's being said? No, we don't, we don't connect with what's being said. At the most, some of us know some tajweed. Very few of us actually know the Arabic language. So then is it our fault that we're not able to pay attention in Salah? What's the point of praying if I can't even pay attention? What's the point? You know, and why is that my fault? And this line of question on and on and on and on and on. And you know what that fitna boils down to? <clears throat> Overwhelmingly, a huge population of Muslims all over the world, including here, with this is no exception. Thank you so much. With this is no exception. Is actually, we're, we're distanced from the Quran. For I would argue no fault of our own. 
no, not necessarily a fault of our own. We have been distanced from the Quran. Colonizing nations or colonized, colonized nations of the world, which majority of them are Muslim. The Muslim nations of the world were invaded, I t alluded to this yesterday, they were invaded by foreign curricula of education. And in these curricula, deliberately the Arabic language was removed from the education systems of most Muslim nations. As a matter of fact, even in the Arab world today, in the free Arab world today, I went to Qatar recently within the last couple of years. And when I went there, I was shocked to find that the youth of Qatar are far better in English. The educated youth of Qatar, they are better in English that they are, than they are in Fusha Arabic. Arabic is even deteriorating in the Muslim world. It's deteriorating drastically in the Muslim world. I was on a flight back from the Khalij with a Saudi woman next to me. And we started talking. It was an older lady. She was going to see her, her, her son and her son-in-law. And, you know, her, her daughter and her son-in-law. And she, we started talking and she told me how, you know, in high schools across uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, they are at the, the Nahu and Sarf, the grammar, Arabic grammar curricula is being taken out. Because it's too hard for students. So it's not even that we don't know enough Arabic. Actually, even in the Arab world, there's a massive crisis of people not being able to retain the Fusha Arabic language. As a matter of fact, those of you that have gone to the Arabic world, Arab world to study Arabic, you know this for a fact. You cannot speak clean Arabic on the street. You'll be laughed at. There are a handful of ulama, tulab al-ilm, serious students. You go in their circles and then you speak the refined form of Arabic. Outside, Arabic is dying. It's just, it's just dying. So if they're not even able to hold on to it in the Arab world, what about us? <laughs> what about us across the Atlantic? What are we supposed to do? What I want to share with you in these few minutes that I have is a strategy, a plan. I don't want to just present a problem to you. I think we have a really good time talking about problems. But we don't spend enough time talking about serious solutions. We have to not just think in the ideal sense. I don't just want to tell you what used to happen at the time of Umar bin al-Khattab or what happened eight centuries ago. That's awesome. But what do we do right now? How do we, we, we can't just press a button and travel back in time. It's not going to happen. We have to not complain about the reality we live in. We have to understand the reality we live in and make the most of the reality we live in. I'll give you an analogy to express what I'm talking about. There used to be a beautiful garden, huge trees. It was just gorgeous. And one day some people came and burnt the whole thing down. It's gone. It's just completely destroyed. And it's been 20 years that we've been talking about this burnt down garden. If we just spent those 20 years doing what? Doing what? Planting some seeds, putting some water. What would have happened in 20 years? We would have had the garden all over again, right? We would have had it all over again. What have we done? We have made it a habit to talk about the problems of the ummah and we want the garden to reappear instantaneously. It takes planning, it takes effort, it takes patience, and it takes little growth at a time. It takes small steps at a time to be able to revitalize what was once destroyed. We can't just cry about that garden that once was. We have to replant, we have to rebuild. And really if you, by the way, if you take a tree from somewhere else, and you force it into the ground, is that tree going to survive? No, why not? What's, the, what's missing? The roots are not deep and they're not artificial and they're not genuine. They're not genuine. So just the smallest storm and what's going to happen? It'll tip over. We want Islam to become a reality in the world, but we don't just want it to become an artificial reality in the world. We want it to be a sustained reality in the world. Sustainability of all the institutions that we build, all the efforts that we make. Now, a, a conference like this one where so many of you have gathered, this is not sustainable. We can only do this once a year, maybe twice a year, maybe. Right? This is not something you can do on a regular basis. But we have to understand that the real thing to build in this generation, in this day and age, the fitna that we face of this, and I'm only talking about one particular fitna, how the ummah overwhelmingly is disconnected from the Quran. That's one fitna I'm talking about, of the many fitnas that we have. 
if, we're wanna, if you want to address this problem, the most important thing, the most important thing is investing in people themselves. Investing in people. Some people argue if we had money, we'd be able to do X, Y, Z. If we had government, we'd be able to do X, Y, Z. If we had you know, infrastructure, if we had control over the media, if we had this or that or the other. Listen, there are Muslim nations who have a lot of resources. There are Muslim nations who have control over many media outlets, etc, etc. But there is something still missing. And what is missing is people. What's really missing is people. We have to build people. Now I'll, I'll tell you a realistic vision that I have in my head. I, I don't think it's you know, like a fantasy, I think it's realistic. Honestly, I think it's realistic. If we take a strategic plan of revitalizing Quran's education, Islamic education, and actually at the heart of it all, personally I believe Arabic education. I, I am a very strong believer in Arabic education for the entire Ummah. Okay? And I think Arabic education, by the way, is the most important part of all of this. You know why? What does Arabic do? It connects a population directly with their book. Right? Which has many advantages. I'll just talk to you about a couple of them, then I'll talk to you about the 10-year the strategy or the, the thought that I have. Look, if you go to a mechanic and you don't know anything about cars, can the mechanic take advantage of you? Can he say, uh, are you going for an oil change? And he says, you need a new transmission. You need a new timing belt. I think you have to replace your engine, etc., etc." Can he do that? He could. And if you don't know anything about cars, you will be taken for a ride. Human beings, when they have, because he has knowledge you don't have. When one group of people has knowledge that other people need, and they hold it to themselves, then there is a tendency that one group will be able to take advantage of another group. Now, if, you are, if you're not an expert in cars, but at least you have a basic education in cars, you know what a timing belt is, you know what a transmission is, you know where the, you know, the, the antifreeze fluid goes, etc., etc., and your mechanic says, you need a new engine or you need a new timing belt, you can just take a quick look at it and say, actually, I don't. I don't. You, it's not easy to take advantage of you because you have yourself at least some direct access to authentic information. You read me so far? In the religious realm, in the religious realm, this is not limited to Islam but includes Islam. People get take adva taken advantage of. Muslims get taken advantage of just like Christians and Jews and Hindus get taken advantage of when a small group of people have knowledge and the vast majority of people are not even minimally educated. They're not even educated in the minimum. So I depend on this shaykh or this imam to tell me everything and I need to know nothing. Is it possible that we have handed too much power to one human being? And is it possible that even though they have an Islamic education... Oh, it's okay, yeah. It's okay. I like sweating. It's the thing. Okay. Is it possible that even though they have an Islamic education, that there may be an element of corruption. Is it possible? Absolutely. I can tell you honestly, just because somebody studies Islam, including myself, doesn't mean we're a good person. Those are two different things. That's, those are two different things. And unfortunately, we now, because we have such little education, what happens? Somebody makes a crazy claim on behalf of Islam, and we are actually intrigued, and we think maybe that is from Islam. Maybe that is right. What I heard in that speech must be correct because that guy clearly knows more than I do. Clearly he knows more than I do, so I must trust what he's saying. Now even though we ha this religion is a religion of trust, I trust you and you have to have some level of trust in me if you're sitting here, obviously it means you have some level of trust in me. But at the same time, there needs to be transparency in Muslim society. And that transparency can only happen if the average Muslim citizen is given at least a minimal education in their religion. And they have a direct access with the Book of Allah. Direct access to the Book of Allah. So that when the Imam and the Shaykh is offering a tafsir of the ayah, they can see what he's saying directly. They're learning something, but they're validating what they're learning at the same time. And when they hear something that they read the ayah and it just doesn't add up, it just doesn't make sense. I don't see how he came to that conclusion. You have a right to disagree. 
Muslims have always had a right to disagree and ask questions. We are not capable anymore of asking intelligent questions to our scholars because we don't have a minimal education. So now, right now it's, tell me what to do, you have all the answers, I have nothing, I have zero. This is not the way of the Muslim Ummah. We are an inspired people, an educated people. We are the nation of Iqra. We are the nation of reading. And when you become, when you become educated, then you hold your leadership to account. And they don't get away with anything. And that is how it's supposed to be. We're not insulting our ulama. No, 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 no. This is not about saying our ulama are worthless or we have to question everything they say. No, but we have to be able to have an honest, open conversation with our scholarly leadership. That's supposed to be able to happen. We're supposed to be able to engage in a healthy dialogue. If the Sahaba are not, sub, are not beyond being questioned, if Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu is not being, uh, beyond being questioned, if the great ulama of this deen like Abu Hanifa rahimahullah welcomes critical questions and disagreements from his students, then why did that happen to our ummah? And by the way, yesterday I talked to you about Christian history. What was the policy of the Catholic Church? What was their policy? Don't ask questions. And if you do, you get an answer. And if you disagree with that answer, you're a kafir. You have no right to ask questions. You are not in a position to disagree. This kind of bullying, this kind of a mafia mentality is not Islam. You know, they say the secularists, anti-religion people, modernists, they say that religion is the opiate of the masses or a religion is a, a means of control over society. It blinds people's intellect. Islam came to free people's intellect. It came to free people's intellect. It came to ask you, one of the most common demands of the Quran is for you to think. So you can think. We have to be a thinking society. That cannot happen within Islam, within the discussions of Islam, if the ummah overwhelmingly is not directly connected with the Book of Allah and with its essential sources, with some minimal education. Now you can learn from lectures and things like that, like you can take notes of an ayah. You're listening to a lecture and you're taking notes about an ayah or a hadith. But if you don't know Arabic, is that first-hand information or second-hand information? Tell me. That's second-hand information. You don't know for sure what it says, it's second-hand because you're taking it from the person who's teaching you and you're writing these notes down. This is what the hadith must mean, this is what the ayah must mean. And I'm sure it means that, but it's really important in this ummah that this ummah have what? First-hand information, first-hand access. You know, our religion is incredibly powerful. It is incredibly powerful. It is the first time that we remove power from the intermediaries. The Christians have the church, the, 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 the Pope. You know, the, the, the Hindus have the Pandit. You have to go through him. He's holier than you. You have to go to him to be sanctified. But in Islam, you and I are equal. Even the da'i standing up on a podium, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالْ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who could be better than the one who calls to Allah and does good things and declares, I am from among the Muslims. Meaning, I'm not standing above them. I'm not better than them. I am from among them. I am as much subject to scrutiny and questioning and criticism as everybody else. As everybody else. That is the society of Islam. We don't have a clergy culture. We don't have a popifying culture. Unfortunately, it has developed in the Muslim world. It has happened. And it has happened as a result of a lack of standardizing the education of the Quran, standardizing the education of the Sunnah, of the Seerah of the Messenger wasallam. Because people don't know even a minimal amount, they have to kind of resort to personalities and just hey, latch onto them. Latch on to them. This is not the way that it's supposed to be. So now, a, a bit about the strategy, just very quickly. I think, by the way, let me see a show of hands. How many people here work full time? Work full time, okay. How many people, how many ladies here are, uh, you know, full time moms? Or full time mothers, okay. How many teenagers in the audience? I want to see, teenagers? College students? College students? Okay. So there's quite a, it's a diverse demographic in the audience. Now all these different groups of people, the elders in our community, sorry I didn't ask about the young at heart. Uh, how many people with, with gray beards but still young at heart? Yeah, okay, very good. Okay. <laughs> 
So I have, I have one gray hair. I feel your pain. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is every segment of our population can actually be a, a, a program of education can be created for every segment of our population based on what can actually work for them. Not everybody can give up their life and go study somewhere. We can't do that. Not any, everybody can learn full time. Not everybody can learn overnight. Not everybody can learn within a year. But everybody should be on a journey of learning. Everybody here should be on a journey to educate themselves. And because of the advent of the internet, because of the advent of the explosion of information, we have to take advantage of this and create the best, met the best possible methods of teaching Arabic, of teaching the Quran, of teaching the Seerah, of teaching Islam. The best we can possibly do. We have to proliferate this now and offer people a chance to grow little by little by little by little. So within, within the next decade, you find an entire community of people that when they stand behind the Imam in Salah, in Taraweeh, even though they're not Hufaz of the Quran, when the Imam makes a mistake, they know it because they know Arabic that well. They could just tell that's not an ayah, no, 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 that can't be right. And that can happen within 10 years. And that can happen with part-time effort. It's not full-time effort, it's part-time effort. That is something I'm hoping to accomplish through the organization I'm a part of. I'm not here to advertise Bayina, I'm really not. I just, I believe that this like step-by-step -step kind of strategic approach for every community, Alhamdulillah, you know, I've given three talks here, but I think the most important conversation I had in my trip here was behind the scenes with the organizers of this conference where we talked about how can we spread Arabic education and Quran education in Trinidad in a sustainable way and how can we turn within the next two, three, four years, how can we have young men and women that are enthusiastic, charismatic and are actually great teachers of the religion and of the Arabic language within this community? How do we build talent from within this community that educates this community so they're not waiting for another import that they produce their own? They produce their own and they produce their own in a way that respects the, the leadership that is already here, the scholarship that's already here, but is also able to reach out to the youth and is able to reach out to other segments of the population. I think there should be an army of female teachers in this community. There should be an army of them. There's not a single Muslim woman in this community that should not be part of some kind of course or some kind of learning. We should be celebrating education. And I personally believe in women's education far more than I do in men's education. Because we, uh, you know, you know. We don't even take notes and stuff. We, it hurts our hand, right? Women are serious learners. And you know, these people, they're going to teach our kids. We don't teach anything, you know it. They teach our kids. We, we have to invest in women's education. But it will not happen from the men's side. We have to create these people. We have to build them from the ground up and it's possible. It, it can be done. The most important investment of our time is in our people and in our youth. It's the most important investment of our times. If you have young people in your community that are already active, trying to learn their deen, trying to serve, they're good with children, they have a nice, easy-going personality, other younger kids gravitate towards them. You have to identify those boys and girls, and you have to invest in them, and you have to offer them the best religious and the best worldly education possible, because we need highly intelligent leaders for tomorrow. Leaders that understand their religion, and leaders that understand the world around them. You know, that's what we need right now. And that will not come from somewhere else, it will come from Trinidad. You'll have to invest yourself. You'll have to build that yourself. I can only help maybe through my institution in one small piece. Maybe I can make the Arabic education a little easier. Maybe I can start their journey off in Quran education. But the picture is much bigger than that. The, the picture is a lot, much, much bigger than that. Given all the fitna that we have here, all the fitna. What did the Prophet ﷺ say about Dajjal? Even if you see him, what should you do? If you're planting a seed, what do you do? You keep planting it. You just continue to plant it. Don't get overwhelmed by all the fitna around you. We have to plant these seeds. And by seeds, I mean the people. But the people. If the community learns to invest in their people 20 years from now, they are not going to be making the same complaints they are making today and that they were making 20 years ago. Something is going to change. And that's what I'm hoping we can do, not just here, all over the world. I, wanna, I think we can get there. I think within a 10-year span even, 
within a decade, we can reach a point where there's like the average Muslim teenager has a pretty good knowledge of the, a pretty good understanding of the Quran and a very clear understanding of their deen and are very fluid in the Arabic language. I think we can get there. I don't think it's unrealistic and especially not for a place like here. You guys have incredible talent. You have incredibly resourceful people. You are well networked. Everybody knows everybody else. It's a well tight knit community. Even if you have disagreements, you're working to, you're working towards, you know, commonalities. I met, you know, imams from several different masajid over a brunch the other day. I mean, there are, even the leaders are starting, are seeing the importance of unity and it's a great thing. The last year's convention I was told where the group hug happened on the stage. These are signs of something good happening. So you have to ride that wave and you have to individually, individually, I'm not just giving you this to feel good. Individually, you have to think, how can I contribute towards this? What can I do to further this effort? What are my talents and how can they go towards building something that 10 years from now will become a service that people just come to depend on? It's just a part of our society that just didn't exist 10 years ago, you know? When I, when I, one of the things that humbles me, it's so beautiful. You know, I've been running my school, the full-time Arabic program at, in, in Texas for four years now. It's our fifth year starting this year, inshallah. And I meet little kids when I go to like California or New York or somewhere. And some parents will come to me and this 12-year-old kid will come to me and said, you know what my dad said? He promised that when I graduate high school, I can come to your school. And I just sit there and go, whoa. Now people are making their children's life plans and we are part of their plan. Like we became part of somebody's family, you know, aspirations. What, 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 was it? It, what was this effort? It was just something small on a laptop. That's all it was. And now it's some family deciding that their children, part of their education will be that they're going to go through the Bayina program or whatever else. This is what we have to do with our institutions. And we have to check. The last comment I'll make is yes, we have, alhamdulillah, you, the, the, the community already has masajid, already has weekend schools, already have Islamic schools, already has a madrasa alimiya program here. You have some great institutions already here. And this is not a criticism of any one of them, but myself and everybody included. If we are not constantly re-evaluating our work, if we are not constantly saying to ourselves, are we providing the best possible service we can? Are we providing the best possible education we can? Are we doing the most efficient work that we can? If we don't constantly seek to improve ourselves, if our schools and our masajid and our institutions are not constantly changing, that means that they are happy at the, with the way things are. And I tell you, the world doesn't stay in one place. Those institutions that are refusing change are going to be left behind, whether they like it or not. And if you are sitting in the audience today and are members of those institutions, please don't take this offensively. Please take this as a constructive criticism. It's constru even for myself, if we're not constantly thinking on how to attack the next frontier, how do we reach the people that we haven't been able to reach? Maybe it's not just them, maybe something is wrong with us. And by the way, that is the ultimate disease of Muslim institutions. You know what we do when people don't come to us? These people, what is wrong with them? They don't come to us. They don't come to us. They don't come to learn from us. They don't come to our halaqa. They don't come. No, no, no. Maybe if they're not coming, something is wrong, not with them, but with our approach. Maybe we, ha we haven't been relevant. Maybe we haven't thought about how we can make them interested. You know, our, our anger is, that's the same thing once again. How come no trees are growing over here? Well, plant the seed, buddy. Maybe the seed you planted is not the right kind. Maybe you need another kind of seed. You have to reevaluate. That is the culture that has to be developed across the communities of the Muslims all over the world, including here. And that's the message I want to leave you guys with. Yes, we are in a time of fitna. Yes, there are challenges. But what's the surprise in that? Allah says, what are you just going to say you believe and no test will come? No test will come. Tests are obviously the tests are going to come. But you have to rise to the occasion. So may Allah Azza wa make us of those who rise to the occasion. I'll leave you with this beautiful ayah from Surah Al-Ankabut. Allah Azza wa says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُدْخِلَنَّهُمْ فِي الصَّالِحِينَ The remarkable lesson, those who believe and do righteous deeds, we will certainly enter them into the company of the righteous. We will, we will in, inject them, we will you know, embed them in the company of good people. This some ulama say talks about Jannah. Meaning you'll be among good people in Jannah. Others say no, when you do good work in this world, 
naturally other people that have good in their heart will come to you and say, how can I help? And you will actually build a community of people that are trying to do good things. In the middle of fitna, the people of good will just converge. They'll just come together naturally. And that's the, what's going to happen. That's real community. When you are united by a, a vision, by a task, and other people see value in what you're trying to offer, and they jump on board and they say, let, let me help you with that. I want to be a part of this too. You know, and that's what you're going to have here, inshallah ta'ala. That's my hope and that's my dua for this community. That Allah Azza wa Jal gives you vision, gives you enthusiasm, and gives you the, 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 the correct thinking and strategy to be able to provide solutions for the Muslim community in education, in social services, in, in just raising our bar, raising the bar. And on every aspect, everything the Muslims do should be the best that it can possibly be. It should possibly be. And I hope you guys become a model of that bi'ithnillah ta'ala. Thank you so very much for listening and paying attention. I am extremely happy to have the opportunity to be here. Insha'Allah, we go basalaim one day. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.